Matthew 12, verse 36, Jesus is speaking and he says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shall be justified, and by thy words thou shall be condemned. We need to hear that again. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shall be justified. And by thy words, thou shalt be condemned. One of the most powerful forces in all the universe is the spoken word. And I'm not just talking about the word of God. I'm just talking about what you and I have coming out of our mouth every day. We don't realize the power that's behind our utterance. Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. That ought to give us a hint, hadn't it? And that's not talking about God's tongue. That's talking about our tongue. Our spoken word is amazingly powerful, and we don't realize it. We don't realize it. In the beginning of creation of this universe, there was chaos, the Bible says, until God spoke. You remember how it, how it starts? It says, in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Then it says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And it says, the Spirit of God, the King James says moved, but the literal translation from the Hebrew is brooded or hovered over the waters. And then it said, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. There was only chaos and darkness until God spoke. And when he spoke, Holy Spirit moved and brought order out of chaos and goodness out of darkness. Because as you continue to read that account, it says everything that God made, he looked and saw that it was good, right? So the spoken word has amazing, absolutely incredible power. Now, here's something that we tend to forget. We say this, we give lip service to this, but I don't think we really comprehend what it means. The Bible tells us also in that account of creation, it says, God said, let us make man in our image, in our image. So God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them and gave them dominion. We're created in the image of God, the representation of God. God created man, I believe, so much in his image that when someone on this earth or some creature on this earth looked at man, I'm talking about before the fall, that they would actually think they were looking at God because this person that God created in his image was clothed in his glory and the reason I know that is because when the glory departed man realized he was naked and he never did before God's glory lifted off we were God's representatives we were God's rulers on this earth until we rebelled against God our word still has creative power we've got to understand that because we're created in the image of God and as God's word brought forth formative creative power our words do as well because you're created in the image of God now here's the question what are most of us creating we need to let that one sink down for a minute what are most of us creating since we're created in the image of God and our word has creative power? Does that mean you and I can go out and speak a universe into existence? Hasn't worked for me so far. No. But our words do have creative power. And I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul gives us a warning. And he says this, 
Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it might minister grace to the hearer. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. If you do word studies, which I like to do, you'll find out that when God says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, or the words that we speak, the things that he's talking about that we say, the Greek word for what we speak is the same Greek word for God's word made flesh, the logos. Jesus was the logos, the word of God made flesh. And when the Bible talks about our utterances, it uses the same word, logos. That's a, that's a frightening thought. <laughs> but here's the thing. God says, don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That word corrupt in the Greek means, it's, it's interesting. It means rotten, but it also means worthless. The two meanings of that word are rotten and worthless. So God says, don't say anything that's rotten, and we know what that is. But don't say anything, say anything that's worthless. We need to be careful what we're saying. Don't let anything like that come out of your mouth. Now look at the next verse, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that when we utter worthless words, the Holy Spirit is grieved? Most of the time we separate these two verses because somebody made a little notation between those two. But they're not separate. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is grieved when you and I say things that are worthless or when we say things that are rotten. Now, why is that? Well, when God spoke, it caused the Holy Spirit to create order and goodness. Do our worthless words cause the creation of rotten, worthless things? Now, you say that's pretty strange. Is it? I'm not turning there, but Isaiah 57, 19 says, I create the fruit of the lips. Sobering thought, isn't it? I create the fruit of the lips. All of us know people that when they come where we are and begin to talk, we get depressed because they're negative and because they're complaining and because they're murmuring and because they're just going on and on about this and that and how rotten everything is. And we know people that when they come, man, our spirits are just lifted. Because they're positive and they're encouraging and they're, you know, you know, they just, they see the good side. You know, we always say, you know, you got some that see the cup half empty and you got some that see the cup half full. We, we all know both kinds of people like that. The reason that effect takes place is because the words that we speak change the atmosphere about us. When we speak, there's a formative, creative force that takes place. And it produces a tangible result in our environment. What happens when we complain? When we list somebody's faults, their past offenses? When we spew out bitterness because of whatever has taken place in the past? Well, over in the book of Hebrews, the address is 1215. Here's what the Bible says. It says, when we begin to do that, we trouble ourselves and we contaminate many. Read it sometime, Hebrews 12, 15. When we list the faults of other people, when we continually, every time something happens, we harp on what they've done to us. And we just have this bitterness that's in us. And when that begins to spew out, it troubles us. And it contaminates a multitude of people. If you really want to see a failure, just keep telling somebody what a failure they are. And it will be manifest because our words have creative power. But what happens? What happens when we speak truth and blessing and the word of God? Well, the Bible says the truth makes us free, doesn't it? Blessing brings blessing. 
And the word of God puts the enemy to flight. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. You'll give account for every worthless word that you speak. Folks, we've got to be careful what we say because the fruit of the lips comes into existence. So God says, listen, don't say anything unless it builds up somebody. And that's what Ephesians 29 says. Don't let that worthless communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, and it means to build up, that it might minister grace to the hearer. You remember when they brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus? And the law called for her stoning? And they were there saying, all right, what are you going to do about it? You remember what Jesus said? He said, fine. He that is without sin first cast a stone at her. How many of us live such a perfect life that we can unload and list everybody else's faults and flaws and the times they failed us? How many of us have that perfect lifestyle that gives us the privilege to do that I don't know a single one I don't I only know Jesus who lived a perfect life and when we began to do that we when we start pouring out that venom on other people it causes trouble in us bitterness is a terrible thing it talks about this root of bitterness that's in there and satan loves to fertilize that root and he loves for it to grow and consume us and when we speak those words forth they change the atmosphere and the environment and they don't bring the effect that we want it to bring we think if we list somebody's faults and flaws and and just show them all their errors then they're instantly going to change guess what ain't happening it will go the other direction. But when we begin to minister grace, which is what Jesus showed the woman caught in adultery, which he has shown to every one of us, when we begin to minister grace and forgive and bless instead of curse, and, and when we begin to build people up, you know, folks, listen to me. All of us have failed and will fail again. All of us have come short of the glory of God. And if justice was done, none of us would be alive. We would all be in hell. But God gives more grace, the Bible says. And that's what we're called to do because why? We're created in the image of God. And God wants us to exhibit grace to the people around us. And he wants us to speak blessing and not cursing. And he wants us to speak truth. And he wants us to speak the love of God. And he wants us to speak the word of God. Because if we will do that, you will see the change in the person. But continually listing their faults and flaws every time some little something happens will produce the exact undesired effect because God said, I create the fruit of the lips. And in the book of Job, it says, you will decree a thing and it will be established unto you. Man, what a sobering thought. What a sobering thought. <sighs> Remember when Jesus had his encounter with Satan in the wilderness? He'd just been baptized in the river by John the Baptist. Holy Spirit came down in bodily form. And immediately the Spirit took him into the wilderness. The Bible says he was there day after day after day being tempted and tested by the enemy. And the enemy would come and say, if you are. If you are the son of God, if you are the chosen one, if you are the anointed one, then do this, do this, do this. And every time Jesus would simply say, it is written. He would use the word of God. He would speak God's word. Speaking has power. Speaking God's word has incredible power. The Bible tells us, in the same book in Ephesians that the word of God is the sword of the spirit right the word of God is the sword of the spirit and what that means to me is this when we speak the word of God the Holy Spirit takes up the sword and puts the enemy to flight when we speak the word of God, Satan has to withdraw because the Holy Spirit draws that sword out and he says, come on. 
That's what we've got to do in our situations. We've got to speak the word of God and let Holy Spirit put the enemy to flight. There was, a, there was just an awesome example of that over in Matthew chapter 8. Look at that with me. Over in Matthew chapter 8, about verse 16, Jesus is, is ministering. Matthew 8, verse 16. It says, well, let's back up to 14. When Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Now, here's the verse I want you to see. When the even was come, they brought to him many that were possessed with devils. Listen, and he cast out the spirits with his word. He spoke, and when Jesus spoke, he was, it was the word of God speaking. And when he spoke, the spirit, the Holy Spirit took that sword and put those demons to flight. We're created in the image of God. And when you speak the word of God, the Holy Spirit will take the sword and he will put the enemy to flight. But when we speak bitterness from inside our hearts, when we speak what we've experienced in the past, hurts and disappointments and failures, and when we relive those past experiences that have caused us pain, and it begins to spew out, that gives Satan an open door to come in and establish the very things that we're complaining about. But when we speak God's word into any situation, the Holy Spirit can move, and He can bring life, and He can bring strength, and He can bring health. That's what we have to do. We have to speak God's Word into every situation and not allow the enemy an opportunity to come in. We don't want to give him those options. We don't want to give him those open doors. When we agree with the devil... We're doing the same thing that Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. When they agreed with Satan, they opened the door, and believe me, he came in. No wonder David wrote, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and keep the door of my lips. Listen again. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and keep the door of my lips. That's Psalm 141, and verse 3. We as believers, we as children of God, have to learn. We have to keep in our hearts and our minds that we're created in the image of God and that our words have tremendous power. We must ask the Holy Spirit to guard our mouth. We must begin to speak the truth. We must begin to speak blessing. We must begin to speak God's word in every situation because those words change the atmosphere where you are and the atmosphere of everything that you're going through. We've got to start to declare the promises of God. And we've got to determine and ask God to help us not to speak fear and unbelief and worry, negative statements about another child of God. Remember what he said, the first thing that we read. He said, for every idle word. That's an interesting word, idle. Idle, it makes you sound like you're just not doing anything, doesn't it? kind of what it means in the Greek it means useless inactive or barren words that are useless words that are barren that don't produce what we want them to produce we have to give an account for them and then he says by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned we need to speak words that show we are a justified people Words that show that we're right God, with God. We're in a right relationship with Him. We're walking with Him. We are, we are in His presence. Just as the old prophets would speak and He'd say, The God before whom I stand. The God in whom, whose presence I'm standing. We've got to stand in the presence of God. And we've got to speak in such a way that the world will see that we're a justified people, not a condemned people. A people that have been set free. So whether we're speaking into our own situations or whether we're speaking of, in, about other people's situations or whether we're speaking about an entire nation, we've got to begin to declare hope. We've got to begin to declare blessing. We've got to begin to declare the power of God just as Ezekiel did when he stood looking out over that valley of dry bones. All logic said there is no life down there. 
All logic said there is no hope for these bones other than to bleach out and to finally be consumed back by the earth. But God said, you begin to speak my word to those dry bones. You begin to declare my word and you utter it with your voice. You begin to prophesy it over those dry bones. And Ezekiel said, I did as I was commanded. I began to speak the word of the Lord and suddenly there was a stirring and bones came together to his bone. And suddenly there was sinew and flesh that began to form. And all of a sudden there were complete bodies down there because he had spoken the word of God. We're creating his image. And our words have formative, creative power. And we have to be very careful what we are creating when we're speaking. So he spoke the word of God. And what looked like death produced life. What looked like hopelessness came into being. What looked impossible suddenly became reality. And he spoke God's word. And all those bones came together. And God said, there's another word you need to speak. He said, call for the wind. And Ezekiel opened his mouth and he began to call for the breath of God, the spirit of God to come. And God came and he breathed on this, this multitude of bodies and they stood up. And suddenly where there was nothing but bleached bones and deadness, there was an exceeding great army that was alive and on its feet and ready to produce what was needed. And God is saying the same thing to us. We're to be a people of hope. We're to be a people of blessing. We're to be a people that brings encouragement. We're to be a people that says, listen, there is hope for this world. There is hope for this nation. There is hope for every sick person. There is hope for every lost person. And what we've got to do instead of saying it's gloom and doom, we've got to say, listen, I believe the word of God. And the word of God gives us exceeding great and precious promises. And the word of God says that if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's what the Word of God says. The Word of God tells us in that same chapter that we read in Matthew that Jesus came when he spoke that word, the demons had to flee. He just uttered that word with his, with his voice. And he said the sick were healed. And it said he fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah had said, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. By his stripes we're healed. We've got to speak faith we've got to speak confidence in the word of God and we've got to be careful that we don't utter those statements of fear and unbelief those statements of gloom and doom those statements of hopelessness and I know that we're human beings and whenever somebody says the word cancer and whenever somebody says this that or the other our our, our countenance just falls our, our heart goes into our shoes and we know there is no hope but let me tell you something we serve the God of hope He's still on the throne. He is still almighty. Every knee still has to bow before him. And when we believe his word and we speak his word into those situations, God is going to move because the word of God is the sword of the spirit. And the sword of the spirit will put the enemy to flight. That's God's word. So the problem comes in. When God's people began to speak in in negative ways about situations and individuals. And we all know people that we say boy if they would just stop this or if they would start this or if they would straighten out or if they would quit this or you know you can fill in the blank man they would be all right well here's the deal if you and I will begin to bless them instead of curse them and when we begin to list all the problems with somebody we're speaking a curse over that person we're agreeing with the devil God doesn't look at that person that way God looks at them as somebody that's redeemed and somebody that he's working in. And God looks at that person as what they are going to be when Jesus finishes with them. The Bible says that he is able to keep that which is committed to him. The Bible says that he will bring them and work with them until he presents them faultless before the throne of his glory. So we, created in his image, need to be start moving as God moves and speaking as God speaks and seeing as God sees and thinking as God thinks. And when we look at one another, God help us not to look at the flaws and faults because there are plenty. But you realize, of course, that if we just simply looked in the mirror, we would see more flaws and faults than we see in that other person if we're honest. But God says, listen, you have to give an account of what you say. So please don't say words that are worthless. 
Please don't say words that are barren and don't produce what you want. Please don't say things that are rotten. But say things that will bless and edify and build up and minister grace to the person that's hearing it. And don't let that bitterness of past failures and hurts that you have carefully held inside and cherished and nourished spew out on other people and thereby trouble yourself and defile others. But ask God to heal it. Ask God to deliver you from that. Ask God to wash you and to fill you with his presence and his peace and his love. And ask, you, ask him to set a watch before your lips that you could speak things that would edify and bless. And watch what God will do. Folks, listen, there is such an obvious, physical, real life example of this. If you will carefully watch children you'll see children that the parents bless and brag on and encourage and you'll see children that parents say you'll never amount to anything and ridicule them and put them down and you watch what happens in their lives the same thing is true with husbands and wives in their relationship with each other the same thing is true with family members And the same thing is true with friends. God has given us creative ability with the words that we say. We can create goodness. We can create badness. We can create light. We can create darkness. We can create joy. Or we can create fear, doubt, depression, all those things. When we are doing what God says then we're blessing and edifying and building somebody up. And the Holy Spirit works when we bless. But when we list faults and flaws and failures, and it keeps coming up time after time, we're speaking a curse over that person. And Satan can come in and use those very things to destroy. God is raising up an army of hope, an army of of joy, an army of faith, an army of victory. God is raising up a people that are going to break every chain in Jesus' name. God is raising up a people that are going to walk into a dark world, a hopeless world, and bring light and hope and peace. God's doing that. And I want to be a part of it. And I don't want to ridicule or or pull down or open a door for the enemy to come in and establish something that I have said in a negative way. We've got to speak God's word. We've got to speak the joy of the Lord. We've got to speak the promises of God. Somebody might say, well, you're into that name it and claim it stuff. Well, everything can be taken to an extreme. I understand that. Any truth taken to extreme becomes heresy but what I want us to see this morning is this God has not given us a creative ability so that you and I can walk out and start prophesying that we're going to have a million dollars and it show up on the doorstep but God has given us a creative ability that we can create an atmosphere we can create an environment where he is welcome and and free to work or one where the enemy is welcome and free to work God has given us a creative ability that we can speak things and God establishes those things or the enemy will depending on what we say so as Ephesians says don't let that worthless communication come out of your mouth but speak those things that build up whether it's an individual whether it's your child whether it's your husband whether it's your wife whether it's a family member or a friend watch what you say Because words have amazing power, life and death, in the power of the tongue. And if you want to see someone flourish and grow, bless them, encourage them, and don't, don't, don't speak those words that tear down. Because if you do, it will bring you trouble and those about you. Let's not do that. Let's remember, we're created in the image of God, and so is everybody else around you. And why would you want to run down the image of God? So as we walk through this world, let's be blessers and not cursers. Let's be those who have hope and not hopeless.
Let's be those that bring joy. And people rejoice when they see us coming. Because they know that when we come, we're going to bring the joy of the Lord. We're going to bring the hope of the Lord. We're going to bring the word of the Lord. And we're going to bring the power of the Lord. So whether, whatever it is that you're thinking about or walking through, make sure that what you're saying is what you want to happen rather than what you fear will happen. Because by your words, you'll be justified. And by your words, you'll be condemned. Let's bow our heads. Father, I worship you this morning. And God, I ask stand here before you and ask you to forgive me for every negative word I've ever spoken. I ask you to forgive me for every time I've ridiculed any person or listed their faults and flaws. Forgive me for every time I've looked in someone's face and said, this is what you've done and that's what you've done and on and on and on. And God, I pray that you'll set a watch before my lips that what comes out of my mouth will be pleasing in your sight what comes out of my mouth will minister grace to those that hear it what comes out of my mouth will bless and bring hope and encouragement God I ask you to do that and Father I pray for every person here every person that's listening every person that's watching by whatever means Lord, I pray that every child of God will become a bearer of good news. Lord, you said how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. I pray that we'll be those people. That every situation that we enter in will bring hope. That we'll bring encouragement. That we'll bring the blessing of God and the power of God. Lord, I pray that you raise that army up that will march through this land. And bring light into the darkness and turn the course of a nation. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. And God, for every person this morning that has a root of bitterness, for every person this morning that has those repeated episodes of, of just railing on other folks and listing all their flaws and faults, I pray this day for deliverance in the name of Jesus. I pray that they would be set free from past hurts. I pray that Holy Spirit would heal hearts that have been shattered, hearts that have been damaged from past failures, Lord, from past abuse, from whatever. God, I pray for a mighty touch of the Holy Spirit to heal them. And Lord, I pray that they would be filled with your joy and your love and your grace. God, I pray that you change all of us in the way that we speak in the way that we react in certain situations and that we'd be a people of tremendous hope and faith and grace because we're created in the image of a God who is tremendous in his hope and in his grace and in the faith that he gives us. Lord, we love you today. We worship you and we praise you. Lord, we ask you to go with us now and let us be a people that speak your word, your blessing your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.